Hey, fanboy nation. This is your pal Daffy Duck, and you're watching. You're watching. We're watching. You're watching fanboy. 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 A fanboy, etc. Fanboy nation. Dot. I assume. Uh, um. <laughs> You know, it's always fun when you get to talk to old friends and new friends about their current project. And today we're talking about a new play called Joyland. Gentlemen, introduce yourselves, how you're affiliated with this thing and what can we can eh, and what can we expect from it? You see, you're so excited. I am. You're you losing your tongue. tongue say, yeah. <laughs> Gary Morgenstein, I'm along with Russell Friedman. I'm the co-creator and co-writer of Joyland, which is a new um, scripted TV series. Um, and we're launching on YouTube episode one of the first season of eight episodes and i'm going to let russell introduce himself and then we could tell you how we're doing this in the pandemic hey robert thanks for having uh, us as gary said my name is russell friedman i'm co-creator i'm a veteran of a long-term career in um, network television um, decided to get into the content creating business um, technological advances have enabled the creator to make content and bring it direct to the viewers. And that's what we're trying to do to showcase our story. Um, we delve back into our collective pasts. Um, Gary, normally a sci-fi writer and a forward thinking visionary, uh, we've decided to look back into our past, take our collective experiences, put it in a big boiling pot, and we came out with Joyland. And since we're talking about you guys going back into your past and reliving your youth, I'm expecting the early 2000s, late 1990s? Yes, it is. Just a little further back. God bless you for that. Thank you. The 1960s, um, Joyland starts in 1964. And first of all, I'm going to tell you how we're doing it. We're doing it, we're using the Zoom platform for now. So I don't know, I'm not going to say the, we're the only people doing this. I'm sure other people have decided to be sugar enough to do a scripted TV series via Zoom, but that's what we have at the moment. Uh, in time, we hope to be able to start filming scenes once the lockdown you know, gives us whatever that is here in New York um, in New Jersey will enable us to do that. Um, but it's the 1960s resonates, still resonates with people because so much of today can be traced back. And so much of what started in the 60s remains unresolved. For example, we open our um, episode one opens on, in July 1964, and there's riots sweeping Brooklyn in New York City because a, a, a cop killed an, an unarmed African-American teenager. So some things never change. So what we try to do, and we the, people have looked at the 60s, but we're trying to show the 60s as, it's, as it hasn't been portrayed. I'll tell you a few ways we're doing it. Number one, we lean a lot into the class element of it. And uh, when we talk about civil rights, it's set in the North. It's set in Brooklyn, and it's set um, another wrinkle. It's set in a bungalow colony in the Catskill Mountains, which was for people who are not familiar with it, the Catskills. And I'm going to let Russell pick up on this in a moment. Um, were the, the getaway for working class and middle class New Yorkers, many Jews who were tired of you know um, hot times summer in the city because you didn't have air conditioning back in those days. So for two months out of the year, they paid what was it, Russ? a few hundred dollars for a bungalow, you had the pool and you had the serenity. So we want to contrast the edginess and the darkness of the 1960s and all that was swirling about uh, 1964 starts less than a year after the assassination of John Kennedy, when we'd like to feel uh, a lot of America's innocence died. We're less than two years out from the Cuban Missile Crisis, when the world nearly incinerated itself on, on another war. war. So the, we, we see how the start of the women's movement, we see civil rights, and we also lean into sports and the, the rise of the ABA. So what we, we're trying to do is we're showing civil rights and prejudice and segregation, but from the Northern perspective. Often, almost, you, almost always, when the show is set in the 1960s and they deal with civil rights, rightly so, because the South was a hellhole and with very good reason, but they neglect the fact the, the, the strong segregation and the prejudice that existed in the North. Mm -hmm. So we want to show that, and number two, I'm going to turn it over to Russell. What we also like to show is that, and here's my dog, Tiger, you know, I go nowhere without my emotional support dog. Mm -hmm. um, we're showing blacks and whites coming together and trying to find things that they have in common, despite 
all the, the differences there. And we show, we don't go into the projects. We just don't show, again, the, all, all too often there's a cliche of just showing uh, poor African-Americans. These people, whites, blacks, working class, middle class, upper class, friends, not to friends, coming together as friends. So we try to give it that different wrinkle and we look at the, at the class struggle that existed in the 60s, the us versus them. Excellent, Gary. By the way, yeah, Russell, and, did Gary leave six... anything to talk about, or did Gary take off? <laughs> Gary, you Gary should a, let me talk first. Yeah. Gary did a wonderful <laughs> job. No, no. Yeah, I mean, got I, I want. I do want to elaborate. I mean, we both had a common experience of spending tremendous, uh, tremendously memorable summers in the Catskills. It was a great. These bungalow colonies on that side of the show was a great equalizer. Uh, you could be with somebody that might have been, you know, a, a producer in on Broadway and another guy who was driving a truck in the Bronx. But everybody for that period of time kind of elevated their their own feeling of their status. They they you know, the life was was a, a very special moment, as Gary indicated. We're going to kind of watch the 60s and the evolution of the societal changes through the eyes of these average people. Both Gary and I were there when uh, the busing and the integration of schools started in 1964. We began, you know, we forged friendships that were um, in, 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 interracial. Um, and so we have a lot of stories that we want to tell. Plus, we've met both of us, yeah, or I'll speak for myself, we've met a lot of crazy people, a lot of interesting, uh, colorful characters in our life. So we, we're also both huge sports fans. Uh, we love the ABA. Um, again, we, we feel that the growth of that helps um, our characters to develop. It's a parallel thing, a very the birth of a, a new league. Our characters, they're trying to resurrect themselves trying to save a city a lot going on in joy land a lot yeah yeah this is we have a, a very large um ensemble cast because we have a lot of stories it, it, it's keyed off Mar two of the main characters one is marty dent um former um star nick who um hurt his knee in a mysterious accident lost and his career ended so he wants to bring back or he wants to buy a franchise for the new ABA. So we have a little alternative history here. The ABA starts in 1967. He wants a franchise in, in Brooklyn. Now he's got to go up against the establishment who don't want a rival professional basketball league because the owners want to control. They want they want, they want to keep them monopoly. That's something else we look at. Uh, I, I forget the Will Ferrell movie. I, Robert, you, you're going to remember. Oh, it was, with, oh God. I know the one that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, the ABA, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I mean, so much of the ABA is shown from the the showmanship and the and the craziness and and the the the, um, the the red white and blue ball. But why did you need an ABA? It's because the NBA wouldn't let the players organize a union. Mm -hmm. It's because there were unspoken quotas against how many blacks could be on a team. If you go, you want to talk about the North and segregation. As a curiosity, I was shocked once when a friend of mine sent me the average attendance figures for the Boston Celtics in the '60s and '70s. The greatest team in basketball at the time, but one of the greatest teams ever, Bill Russell, Bob Cousy, Sam Jones, on and on, okay? They, they were averaging like 7,000 fans. Why? Come on. You, you know, certain things became very clear. So we want to show the ABA from the perspective of the people who were trying to take on the power brokers. And so much of the show is that. And then the other main character is Julian Bass, who was formerly Marty's um, teammate, on the Knicks, he's African American. He's a reverend, and he's in a, a church which is populated. The congregation is mainly old. So Julian is trying to bring civil rights, but he's has some interdiscipline warfare because that's also the growth of the Black Muslims, who were saying, "Look, we're doing a better job in our neighborhood than you. Look around. Look at what you see. Look at the poverty. Look at the crime. No one gets mugged in our neighborhood. People are respectful. So we try to show all sides." that maybe would not necessarily have been shown. Turn it upside down. Gotcha. And the I, I will say this about the NBA, once they merged with the ABA, the biggest mistake they made was not keeping the red, white, and blue ball. And that's my lighthearted comment for this heavy topic. <laughs> yeah. I um, took most everything else, the three-point rule and right. the, the three-point rule, game. the slam dunks, everything else, you know, the showmanship, Dr. J, all that, yeah. yeah. 
you know, except they kept their ugly orange ball. <laughs> you know? uh, going back, like, so I'm originally from San Francisco and our version of the 60s is obviously different than the New York version of the 60s. Summer yes. of Love garbage, dirty hippies. Like you can, you can <laughs> see how I feel about how I feel about hippie culture because you know when I came around in in San Francisco, they were all burnout drug addicts, homeless, living on the streets. Uh, you know, and not making fun of impoverished people, but I'm saying like the image that once was of the '60s, when they hit the late '70s and early '80s, when I was a, a toddler, sat there and I was like, mm, you guys didn't fulfill what you promised, and you know. And everything that you did was, was for not, um, not all of them, you know, but like that was the image when you went down to hate Ashbury of like what they portrayed it as in 67 versus what it was in 87, you know, it's night and day. And what it is now is that Ben and, you know, at least in the early 2000s, Ben and Jerry's was right across the street from the gap. So that disenfranchised quite a few people. Um, so, you know, San Francisco and, uh, and the 60s was different with Summer of Love. New York in 67 is different with, with the segregation aspect of it and integration and things of that sort. Uh, and people that have fond memories of their youth in the 60s or in the 80s or in the 90s or 70s or wherever, uh, always look back at it as rose-colored glasses. Are you going into actual historical aspects of what really happened versus what you remember from your youth that was cherry-picked of, ah, this was fun, you know, when we were 12 or 13 or whatever it was? Russ, go ahead. I would say, yeah, we are. I think these are the, the kind of things. I mean, all of our characters have dreams and um, their paths are going to always be different. And I think that some of the character story arcs will not be as pretty as we set it out to be in the beginning. They will experience all of the, you know, the highs and the lows, the disappointments. Um, I don't think we're trying to take a preachy attitude to say that everything that happened in the 60s was right, as Gary said, or wrong. But we do want to say that if certain attitudes are replicated amongst people and interpersonal relations and things of that nature, you know, our belief is like that kind of stuff proliferates itself again. But um, no, I don't think we are going to take that typical uh, look at the 60s. It really will be on the, you know, on the ground, on the pavement, um, a real honest look. We, we, that's our goal. Um, that is our goal, Gary. Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's ordinary people caught up in extraordinary times. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we're trying to go for here. And we, what, what we're doing is we're going to have historical figures. In episode, um, in episode 101, we have Lyndon Johnson in the bathroom try to cajole someone into doing his bidding as the president would often do. So we have that, so, so we show that element of it and we try to be clear to the history because you know I'm a big history buff um, and not change around too much. Uh, obviously we're fictionalizing things, but this is pretty much, you know, this is a pretty edgy, darker look. People are, these are regular, like I said, these are regular people, but these are difficult times. And we want to show different perspectives. We also, for example, to, to show another way how we tried to do things differently in the 60s. And you know how many times we've seen the story of the board housewife who takes smokes a joint and starts wearing a headband and listens to the Grateful Dead and then watches an anti-war protests and then somehow is in the Ambassador Hotel in 1968 when Bobby Kennedy's killed. OK, we don't do that. Our political activist, um, Deb Dent, is conservative and she's going to be working in the beginning at least for barry goldwater mm -hmm. so because we want to show that we want to show all sides the goal is not to say to make a we're not telling the audience this is right this is wrong we're saying these are all the people who populated the 60s this is what we went through you decide it's not our job to to preach as russ says we're not telling anyone to think a certain way or feel a certain way but we do want to peek back to the culture of the day, the mores, the style of talk. I mean, look, let's be honest, Robert. Um, we're producing something on Zoom. Um, it is a bit of a hybrid in terms of, um, I think it's a bit of theater in, of the mind, but I think that our story is strong. And I hope that we do produce something that we're going to show on YouTube on March 22nd that 
is entertaining and will move. Um, some of the, the, the problems with, with Zoom is action. How do you show action when you can't go out into the streets and you know shoot on location and um, bring actors together? So look, we knew the hurdles, we took it head on. As Gary said, we were so fortunate to have an incredible cast. Um, we had people uh, performing for us simultaneously in a coordinated effort in two in the UK, one in Los Angeles, one in Chicago, and then of course, numerous we, uh, of the 23, numerous in Jersey and Newburgh, New York and Connecticut and the uh, It is amazing, amazing. And plus, so we were very, very fortunate to uh, get a cast together like this and to get the, the commitment that we needed to, to, to undertake this. And also I wanna, th I wanna say that we were very, very fortunate that our director, Damone Serafin, who has just a certain, he's, he's magic when he's working with talent, actors and pulling out performances. Again, we're playing to a very small computer screen. You can't, you know, fight scenes, different things are very hard to replicate. And also, again, we were fortunate enough, um, our stage manager, a young lady, Cassie Saunders, our technical producer, Paul Litwack. I mean, I think we are getting such a tremendously committed effort um, because basically I think everybody that we've brought on is bought into our story. They love our story and our characters. Um, so we've been very, very fortunate and very lucky and trying to, again, utilize Zoom to its highest capability. I was just talking to somebody that works for ESPN today that does remote sports productions. And I was lamenting a little bit about some of the technological hiccups on Zoom. And he said, we have it on ESPN and we're sending, you know, tens of thousands of dollars worth of gear or Remy's and the thing that we're still getting um, technical gaps and Wi-Fi's that aren't strong. So, but it's been an incredible process, incredible fun, and we're, we're very excited about it. Uh, usually when we do period pieces, it's using the past to reflect on society's ails today. I mean, recently, you know, Judas and the Black Messiah, the trial of the Chicago Seven, uh, these just came out this year, um, you know, through Warner Brothers and through Netflix. Uh, there's a reboot of The Wonder Years this time. Well, I wouldn't necessarily call it a reboot. I'd say a companion piece to The Wonder Years, but now taking place with an, with an African-American family in Selma, uh, leading up to the march and everything else that, that goes along with it. Uh, in doing a period piece like this, are you truly just reflecting on the 60s or is it also social commentary on today's time? Because that's what they they're tend to use, either whether sci-fi for the future to reflect on today or the past to reflect on today. Well, you see, that that's a that's a, an interesting point. Um, we want to keep it in the 60s. You can draw your own feelings. One of, early on, in the when we first had our table reading, one of the actors, a very experienced actor, he said to the cast, he said, you're you're not you're acting too shocked by the language and we're very careful we just don't throw out pejoratives because i'm i'm not we're not into that to just shock but pete there was a casual bigotry in those days and it wasn't always intended to hurt someone nowadays if someone says a word justifiably so there's outrage back then people talked like that without even thinking about it it was just the interaction that that's how you, you said, oh, all you to Bubba. Oh, you're a typical Bubba. It, I'm not excusing it. So what we try to do is, is deal with the casualness of the bigotry, the casualness of the interpersonal relationships while retaining the edge. We're not saying, oh yeah, in 60 years, there's, you know, this is gonna happen. Because uh, unarmed blacks were getting killed by cops back then. We're not saying, it happens again today. You know what's happening today. We're just taking you back there. We're taking you back to a time to try to lose yourself in that time and lose yourself through the the, the characters without pointing a finger. You know, as, as Russell said, I, I write science fiction and I think when you're talking in the future, you have to be careful not to wag your finger at the past either. You've got to let where you are speak for itself without waving a flag because then you break that fourth wall of being immersed in the time right like when i was teaching presentism was a big thing of judging the past using you know the yeah. the lenses of today versus what was going on back then 
Um, in doing so, I know Johnson was definitely not uh, the most suave of an orator, is, is the nice way of putting it. <laughs> um, and, and revisiting, you know, Lyndon Johnson and some of his attitudes and some of the things that he said and, and had done throughout his, his time as president, uh, you know, it makes for interesting commentary on what led to social ails today. Well, yes, and you have someone like Lyndon Johnson, who was um, who was a bully and autocratic, and his language was not always as it should be, as we try to show actually in the scene, but yet sweeping changes in America, sweeping positive changes, trying to help, you know, to give, for example, you know, African-Americans equal rights, shockingly not having them at the time. But we try to, but we don't try to make it as, we try to make it more casual that this is how it is you see and that's really important because otherwise it's it's not real but i think it you know i think it's impossible not to make television i've always believed is a reflective and a projective medium okay so we reflect our our opinions on it and in the content but it also projects out things sometimes that you don't even write into it and so and also we both believe that you know the famous quote, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So clearly by showing these circumstances and such, one would hopefully maybe see some things that you wouldn't want to replicate today because it wouldn't be in you know, the best interest. I mean, we both believe, you know, we, we do believe in a, 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 a fabric of this country that works together. And, and I think, you know, that that is, a theme in our show of, of bringing people together uh, for the you know that's a positive um i think theme that we do try to bring out on well for example one character um uh, deb there's a scene where she tells her husband that she's getting a job and he's just like no i forbid it and she starts laughing okay and it was it's not like waving for the flag of women's lip but you it just reminds people that's the world that that was, you know, many women's jobs were, would you, would you want cream and sugar in your coffee, sir? And so this husband thinks he has the right to tell, no, you can't work. And she's someone saying we are very strong women. And then we have another character, um, Tyra Bass, um, African-American woman, who is the first vice principal at a, a New York City high school. We actually, we were very careful about researching stuff, by the way. If, if suddenly we wrote something in a script, I remember once I wrote one of the characters orders a tab. I said, oh, Russell was tab around in 1964. <laughs> so we're really very, very careful, even with the language, not to use, you know, um, some words that were not, you know, spoken back then. You know, we really try very much to um, to do that. But of course, the flip side of Zoom is we don't have to worry about costumes. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> although, although each of the characters, and again, the wonderful cast, so Damone said, okay, bring, when you, for your costume, don't get dressed up, but bring one thing that says your character. Is it a blouse? Is it a dress? Is it a hat? Is it a piece of jewelry? And uh, so you do that. Now we also, by the way, um, with the Zoom, so we have backgrounds. You know, the, we try to use the virtual backgrounds. So for example, if Russell and I are the characters in a seed um, interior living room in Brooklyn, 1964, Russell and our genius um, tech producer, uh, Paul Litwak, would research photographs to convey what a living room looked like, was it, whether it was going to be middle class or working class or upper class. So it doesn't, it's not intended to be front and center. It's just meant to underscore as best you can. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And it, and it gives it a different perspective, especially doing it through Zoom and not essentially you know, a, a live set piece. Um, and it will be interesting once you can finally have interactions in person on the East Coast, uh, you know, when the snow finally melts. <laughs> I have no more snow. Well, I did see some snow flurries in Brooklyn this afternoon. It was like, oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> did you, you find know, going back to the time, too? <laughs> just going back to picking that summer of 64, you know, I mean, as Gary talked about the Catskills, I mean, like in the 30s, they were starting and there's a heyday and all that and such. So we also watched um, to a degree 
a little bit about of the demise of the, of the Catskills, which, you know, it eroded to a point, like it was probably when Woodstock happened in 69, you know, the Catskills proper was already probably on a downslide. A lot of people remember the Borscht Belt and the heyday of the comics. Um, it, was, it was an incredible place, I tell you, between sports, entertainment and recreation, outdoor recreation. It, it was like one of the premier, premier vacate, vaca forget just for Jewish people from New York or Italian people. It was like one of the premier resort areas in the United States. And it just kind of fell off the table. And, and we lead into that. Excuse me, yeah. and we lead into that because of the bungalow colony, they have a nightclub, which is supposed to bring in revenues and help save the, the bungalow colony. So not every week, but many weeks, we're going to have a bit at the end where some comic or singer or some entertainer is going to be that character, you know, that well-known character before they became famous. Right. So you're going to have Don Rickles performing at least once a week. Yeah. Well, when, every so what? <laughs> once a season. Right. Possibly. Uh, uh, all right. So let's pick a fight between the two of you. I know Gary is a Yankees fan. Russell, let's make yes. you a Mets fan so you guys can box this out. I think I am a secret Mets fan. I've been oh, I accused it. of being a secret Mets fan. Yeah, well, here it's coming out now. You broke the story, Robert. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I guess, I guess I would say I'm a New York fan. You know, underlined twelve times. Um, it's hard not it's, for me. It's hard not to be a Mets fan because going back to like my first game at Pol Polo Grounds, 1963, was a Mets game, a doubleheader against the Giants. Willie Mays hit a home run in the first inning. Um, but Gary and I go to Yankee games all the time. Um, I'm, 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 I'm both. It's a strange thing. I don't know what, who I, I root for the Yankees in the World Series. And that's why Russell has been banished to New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, Brooklyn Dodger fans became Mets fans. Uh, is that yeah. what is that what happened with it? Yes. He's yes. a Bronx boy. Yeah. <laughs> And then what happened to New York Giants fans? They just they just all disappeared. I you know, think a lot of them Mets still fans follow, too. Yeah, but a lot of the Giants fans actually still follow this. You know, kind of followed the San Francisco Giants. They were an outlier from all I read. The sort of the Giant fan was that you know your Brooklyn fan was the rabid, you know, dem bums and the crazy uh, the, the, the Brooklyn Symphony, the Knot Hole Gang. I mean, there was a whole culture behind them. And the Yankees, of course, were the you know just the greatest team in the world. And then the Giants were kind of like, so I think a lot of people followed Willie Mays out to San Francisco with Yeah, and, do, yeah. and, you know, the Mets should still be paying the Giants uh, a finder's fee for stealing their logo. <laughs> <laughs> and the colors. Right. Yeah. You know, you know, at least the orange. Yeah. It's 33% for, for copy, you know, to avoid copyright infringement. And here all you did was change the black to blue. <laughs> you know. That's still copyright infringement at that point. Now, uh, but, but we have to tease because this is a very heavy topic and it's going to be a very interesting series uh, with everything that's going on and the world has fallen apart. And, you know, I think New York is going to be the last state to open up uh, just because, um, you know, it's, it's going to be some very interesting times. Uh, would there be a hope for a season two that, you know, moving from Zoom to excuse me, an actual studio or, you know, live settings in, in person settings. You know, I mean, that's what we're hoping for. This is what, you know, we're trying, you know, you're a, a Trekkie. So, you know, when I say Kobayashi Maru, we're trying to change the Trekkie as you think, but all I right, well, okay. series, yeah. you know, Kobayashi Maru was what, you know, uh, James Kirk changed the rules of the no win, -win situation mm -hmm. at the Starfleet Academy. What we're trying to do is change the rules to how you get a television show. Right. develop. So we're doing this as a showcase. We're saying, this is our story. Here's our episodes. Come and get us. Yeah. But we sure would love to launch um, in, a, in a robust way with a yeah. proper budget to really replicate those times. We would love yep. that. Yeah. Well, I, I think you guys can pull it off. What is the YouTube channel that we can find the series on? We're going to send the link out. Okay. Yes. Yeah. The YouTube channel, Pound Joyland, will get you there. Um, yeah. Okay. Gentlemen, this is going to be some, some interesting stuff. The launch date, you said, is March 22nd, which is yes. a Monday. Uh, Monday night. Drop on the East Coast. Seven, seven o'clock. 
Seven o'clock on the East Coast, so that means it's yes. dropping four o'clock here on the West Coast. Uh, yes, indeed. You know, let's say, midnight in London. What's that? Midnight in London. Oh, who cares about those foreigners? This is America. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so midnight in London. Yes. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, we always we fought a war to get rid of those people. We don't. That's care what right. Time That's all right. Them. Amen. That's it. Chase yeah. them away. <laughs> But with, but with all that said and done, midnight in London, 7 p.m. in New York, uh, 4, p, 4 p.m. On, on the West Coast, someone's scrolling through YouTube, they want something to catch on, why do they need to tune into Joyland? Because I think they're going to be entertained, because I think they're going to be moved, they're going to laugh, and they're going to love the characters. Yeah, entertainment and something a little different and something a little spicier than the typical Zoom um, session that people are used to all right so joyland premieres monday february or i'm sorry monday march 22nd let's yes. get the right month you know, <laughs> we don't we don't know up from down everybody's been in lockdown for so long so so monday march 22nd on youtube uh joyland is premiering uh where can we find everybody on social media if we want to connect and then it's hashtag joyland i assume yes and it's at writer gary and we're on facebook of course and you could always go to find me at my author page at bhcpress.com. All right, Russell, what about yourself? Um, Russell Friedman on Facebook, and I'm on Instagram too. I, I, I guess it's Russell Friedman on Instagram. Right. So if we, want, if we want to argue politics, we'll follow Gary on Twitter. And if we want to watch you know, cat pictures, we'll go to Russell's Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Again, Joyland thank premieres you. March 22nd, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. And sometime over in London, no, midnight in London, uh, you know, please check it out. It's going to be interesting to watch a series that was filmed entirely on Zoom. Thank you, Thank Robert. You, Robert. Thanks for having us on. Absolutely. Pleasure.